Hi, I'm Tom Seven. This is a supplement to my video that I just posted about reverse emulating the Nintendo to give it superpowers. And uh, if you haven't watched the video, you must. Um, I demand that you watch it before this one. It, first of all, this won't make any sense, and second of all, it contains all sorts of spoilers. Also, this video is going to be, I hope, <laughs> low production value because these things take forever to edit. But a few people asked about um, you know, the process I went through, and I also thought there's some technical things that I'd like to share that I didn't get a chance to fit into the previous video. Um, so that's what this is. So first of all, where did this idea come from and how long did it take? That's a question a few people were asking me. Um, so one of my habits is to write down almost every idea that I have. Uh, and there's two important functions that this serves. One is that it's a terrible feeling to me, really terrible feeling, to recall, to remember, oh, I had an idea yesterday, and, and of course I think it's a good idea, but I can't remember what it is. Uh, so when I write those things down, I can just look in the file and I can see, uh, oh, it wasn't a good idea, of course. But that's, it's good for the spirit to not have to be stressed out about having lost an idea. The other thing is, and occasionally there are good ideas, uh, sometimes I'm in the mood to create something or I need to create something, um, but I don't have an idea at the ready. And so here's where this file, which I don't look at except when I'm in one of these moods, ready to act, um, that's where this file comes in. So that allows me to wake up one morning and feel good and feel like making something and then be able to have a good idea at the same time, which is something that otherwise is very, very uh, unusual for those two to happen at the same time. So in this case, I had to travel across the country to give some talks and um, I had some ideas uh, to look into. And that was about two months before, um, before the talks were scheduled. So I tried to pick an idea that was about that right size. I might have gotten that wrong. Um, and the specific idea that I'd written down had to do with when I was uh, working on this 3D Nintendo project, I, I saw something that was in the documentation or reverse, en reverse engineering documentation about the Nintendo that there's an expansion port in the bottom. No one ever used this as far as I know, but you may have seen it. And it has a bunch of pins on it. And one of those pins allows you to supply a color directly to the rendering unit. Um, during rendering, which I thought, oh, maybe you could use that to make the Nintendo produce much better graphics than it was otherwise capable of. So that was basically the idea. And when I sat down and thought through this idea uh, two months ago, um, the first level of detail on it, I kind of realized, you know, you don't, you don't need to use that. Uh, there's more direct methods using just like an unmodified cartridge where I could get that same phenomena that I had hoped for, that impossible graphics. Um, and, and I thought that was way more elegant and maybe a better challenge less cheating. And so uh, that was what I set out to do. So to really get started with this idea, I spent the first full day um, trying to prove that it wasn't possible. And I think this is really good hygiene uh, for almost any project where you aren't sure that you know how to do it, which is most projects, I think. Um, so what I did was I took apart a Nintendo cartridge. Here's Zelda, you've seen this cartridge before. Um, and inside, of course, is a little circuit board. And I tampered with this. So I, I cut one of the pins on the ROM. This is the uh, graphics ROM. And I soldered uh, wires to some of the other traces on the circuit board. And one of these is to the power, one of these is to ground. Um, there's some other ones. And what I did is I, I plugged this into my Nintendo, which I had to disassemble, of course. And I, I just poked them at the, um, at the pin to, to, to verify that I was able to change the screen's uh, behavior, the rendering behavior, uh, by manually uh, changing the voltage level on this pin. And that verified that I knew <laughs> that my hypothesis about how the Nintendo worked uh, was right, and that I wasn't going to, for example, just crash the Nintendo uh, because I was doing something outside of its electrical, electrical characteristics. And this worked totally great. The other thing I did was attach some wires to some timing pins on this. And I used another device, um, another device, I used a device, this is a USB logic analyzer, which is like an oscilloscope, basically, that you plug into your um, computer. And it's got this octopus full of, uh, of probes that you can put onto a wire or directly onto a chip or sometimes a trace. And you can sort of read the voltage. You can see what's happening on that, um, on that trace really fast, like in nanoseconds. Uh, so that's a really useful tool if you're going to do something with electronics. Um, and so I, I measured the timing on this thing. And there's a segment about this. Um, there's a segment about this in the other video. Basically, I convinced myself that first day, like, yes, the Raspberry Pi can, about fast enough, um, change this pin. Because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to find out later that the Nintendo is actually much faster than the Raspberry Pi. They're in the right ballpark. That turned out to be harder than I thought, and it had to do with the difference between uh, latency and bandwidth. Although I can change the bit 
quite frequently, um, the amount of time it takes between me saying, hey, I'd like this, this bit to be a one, and it actually being reflected in the physical universe is longer than I'd like. And that was one of the hardest challenges um, in making this thing work. Probably I just picked the wrong tools. If I had used some embedded microcontroller instead of a Raspberry Pi, perhaps this would have, um, this would have gone much more smoothly. Having done that, the next task was basically to take the Raspberry Pi um, and use it to try to modulate one of the bits on the circuit board. So there's eight of them, and there's also 16 addresses. But I figured if I could do it for one, I could just repeat the circuit over and over again. Um, that's smart because every one of these experiments involves uh, soldering together a bunch of stuff and sometimes breaking components in the process. And so doing it for one bit was the thing. The other thing that was nice about doing it that way is that um, I'm kind of flying blind sometimes when I'm doing this electronic stuff because you can't really see what's going on inside this. I mean, you can put the oscilloscope on it, but you want to have some uh, evidence that lets you debug. The reason why that's so helpful is the Nintendo is a little bit of a flaky device, especially when you've broken some of the pins. And I broke some of these pins because I stupidly tried to put this breadboard in here to... Um, to test whether it would fit. And it has these holes, and these holes uh, <laughs> broke some of the pins or bent them on the way out. That was really dumb. Um, but also the Nintendo's disassembled, so I have to hold this board down with like a stick. Normally the cartridge holds it in place, but I don't have that. So I had to, it's pretty, it's pretty finicky. And I'm constantly taking this thing out so I could solder stuff and put it back. Uh, and so sometimes it just wouldn't boot, and it wasn't my fault, it was just not seated correctly. So just as one example, it's really nice to have um, something else that I believe works like The Legend of Zelda happening inside the Nintendo so that I could see that and I could see my phenomenon. And if uh, neither was there, then I knew the problem wasn't with me, probably. So let's look at some of the graphics that I made on the way. Um, and then let's also talk a little bit about the circuits I use to interface, because I think those are interesting. They're actually like reasonable circuits. Um, and I wish I had known this before I started, so maybe someone else will learn something. And uh, I also want to talk a bit about the graphics pipeline that I made in order to produce uh, high-quality graphics on the Nintendo, the computer side of that. I'm going to talk a little bit about the systems programming in order to uh, get the picture to be as robust as possible. Um, the process of making a circuit board and ordering it and not screwing that up because I learned some lessons there. And uh, I don't know, maybe there's something else. Let's see. So here I have the Raspberry Pi powered through the cartridge interface. Uh, it supplies five volts, which is just the right amount. And miraculously, it boots up and I can SSH into it um, over wireless. This is how I did most of my development. The final product doesn't use wireless. Um, here I'm only plug I've only plugged that in, and I'm this focus is terrible. Uh, the next job is, of course, to connect the bits um, so that I can actually output something to change the screen. So you might think you could just plug the Raspberry Pi right into the Nintendo, like in my fantasy. That doesn't work. Uh, this is actually a really bad idea. It has the potential to break both the Raspberry Pi and the Nintendo. And one of the reasons why it doesn't work is that the Raspberry Pi is 3.3 volts CMOS, and the Nintendo is 5 volts TTL. I don't want to talk too much about what that means, but um, the voltage difference is important. Uh, it just won't work. So. The normal way that you'd get around such a, such a thing, and this is the first thing I tried, is by using a transistor. Now, I was naive about how this works, um, but I'm going to explain to you my, my naive understanding. Basically, I want to be able to make a 1 or a 0, and I'll talk more about what I mean by make a 1 or make a 0, on the Nintendo side. And I can make a 1 or a 0 on the Raspberry Pi side. And I've, I verified, of course, that I can do that. That's what I meant by toggling the bit. So a transistor is like a switch, and what it does is it um, it has this middle part here, and that part, when that's turned off, when it's a zero, the switch is closed, so no um, nothing comes through here. But when it's on, then uh, this current is allowed to th flow through here. And again, I was naive, and this, this drawing reflects a naive understanding. Uh, so it's not really accurate. We're going to get to the, the right thing in a second. So the idea is when it's off like this, um, there's voltage here that comes in and well because it can't go out to ground um, it's like available to the Nintendo that's sort of true uh, whereas if this is sent straight to ground um, then all this voltage is dissipated across this resistor and this is you can see basically connected directly to ground 
uh, so it's a zero or whatever. And that turns out to be naive. Um, actually, one of the reasons, well, among other reasons, one of the problems with that is that it turns out that Nintendo, uh, well, wires are expensive. Um, and so the Nintendo shares this wire for multiple different purposes. It's what's called a bus. And one thing that's completely bizarre about this is that it uses it not just for the RAM and the ROM at the same, or not at the same time, uses it not just for RAM and ROM, but also uses it for uh, addresses. So the addresses and data are sharing some of the same wires, uh, at least the lowest eight bits of the addresses. This leads to a thing um, where if I read an address X and, um, and there's nothing hooked up, then I'm going to get back the data X, uh, at least the lowest eight bits of X. And that's, called, uh, that's from something called bus capacitance. It's just like a little bit of current is sticking around or a little bit of charge is sticking around on the wires, which is crazy. Uh, that actually is what caused this graphic, if I go back to the Zelda thing. Um, th in this, it was actually not hooked up at all. But you'll see those dots, and those dots are alternating lines. The reason why it's on one line and then off the next line is actually because the addresses of those lines um, differ by one bit. OK, anyway, so here's how you actually do this. And this is something I learned, and it, it, it made a lot of stuff actually make more sense to me um, than it did before, so I thought I'd share it. So you use two transistors. And it's important, um, when I put on the previous slide, one or zero, it's not really true that you can output a one or output a zero. That's not the right way to think about it. Something that connects to a bus is uh, trying to assert a one or, a, or assert a zero by causing current to flow either outward onto the bus, supplying current at five volts, let's say, or sinking current. So here, um, in this configuration, which I'll explain in a second, um, I'm supplying current, which means that I'm going to be asserting a 1 on this bus. Now, if someone else is trying to assert a 0 at the same time, it may do almost anything. The behavior is undefined. If someone else is trying to assert a 1 at the same time, it probably will be a 1. Um, but there's no such thing as like sort of writing a bit. It's not like writing a bit to memory, where whoever writes it last gets uh, sort of wins. So here, current is flowing because this is a, a higher voltage uh, flowing through my transistor, which is turned on. Um, and out and is available to the Nintendo. And just for comparison, uh, the, all, the other thing is when I want to assert a zero, when I want to make the bus represent a zero, I do that by taking current from the bus um, and I suck that into my thing and out to ground. Okay. And so now this configuration of two transistors allows me to do either one of those things. Um, and it does it by flipping the transistors uh, to state one and zero or zero one. Okay, so always one of them is going to be on and one of them is going to be off. Except that I can turn both of them off. And when both of them are off, uh, basically this circuit has no effect on the rest of the Nintendo, which means that some other circuit that has the same configuration um, is able to assert a, a 1 or a 0 on here. And I've backed off. Okay, So this is the essence of how buses work. It's what's called tri-state input. There's not just 0 and 1, but there's a third state. Um, for any given participant on the bus, where you're not um, you're not asserting any value, and this is critical because if the RAM and the ROM, um, and in fact the address unit, want to be connected to that same wire at the same time, they you can't just say like, oh, I'm output zero now, so that nothing will happen, because to output zero is to actually draw current off the bus. So I learned about that, and I built a whole bunch of these. Here's an example in an actual circuit. Those two transistors there are uh, a single bit tri-state buffer. And by flipping between the three states, I was able to create these patterns. Uh, it's a wonderful world when this can be considered success. Uh, like I was jumping out of my seat when I was able to create those. But this is like a full screen effect. I could flip back and forth manually between those two, but not fast enough to do it at the pixel level. Despite the fact that there's just two transistors here, it's all instrumented up so that I could see what was going on. And when I looked at it, uh, it looked like this. And so it took basically 180 nanoseconds from the time that I removed voltage um, to the time that the transistor would actually switch off. And I know nanoseconds, it sounds like not a long time, but it's insanely slow because if we go back, uh, let's just flip back. Told you, low production values. Here, uh, the wait cycle and read cycle are just about that same order. So it would take the entire time of one of these cycles for it to discharge, which means I, I could never keep up, right? And I look at the data sheet for these transistors, and it says, yeah, like that's the maximum discharge time. 
which is was very striking to me because I thought transistors are like the simplest you know modern device and uh, that's what everything is made of so how could they be so slow well it turns out in uh, modernity in the 1950s um, th this has always been true of transistors what happens is they get saturated um, when current is supplied here uh, and current is allowed to flow this region it gets what's called saturated with um, electrons or electron holes or whatever it is and then when current is removed um, it doesn't really have anywhere to go so it takes a long time for that uh, for for those electrons to dissipate and for it to turn off uh, so what they did is they came up with an idea of using a diode um, a particularly fast diode called a Schottky diode um, sort of in part with the transistor in order to prevent it from from saturating and the way that that works basically is once the transistor switches on then current is allowed to flow from this top part through it so uh, that also includes the current that's supplied to the switch part so as soon as it turns on now this is, there's like a short circuit that goes up through here um, and back down through which keeps it right at the saturation uh, point and that allows it to switch off much more quickly when um, when voltage is removed so the shot key transistor is I think and maybe 1960s um, in innovation. And uh, this led to um, the creation of a whole series. I mean, there were, this was not the only innovation, but it's part of a whole series of innovations that have happened to TTL, transistor to transistor logic, throughout its history. Uh, and so I was looking a little bit at the like electrical characteristics of the Nintendo and its timing, I mean. Um, and the date, which, you know, is invented and then released in the early 80s, so it was in development before that, lines up just about right with low power shot key, uh, LSTTL. And, you know, there's low and high power and advanced low power and fast. And I think I know where that's leading. So, I, you know, ahead of time, I've copyrighted uh, advanced, fast, low power shot key, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ha ha. Um, but, you know, I saw this LS and then I, I was rec recalling back to the Nintendo uh, looking at the motherboard, which has all these chips on it. And I, I saw, you know, there's this one that says SN74LS. Uh, and it turns out this LS is talking about that logic family because, of course, if you want to build a circuit that works well, they all have to have sort of the same timing characteristics, have to work together. And you do that by using a logic family. And the Nintendo uses LSTTL, and now I know that. I could have known that if I just researched a little bit more instead of trying to wing it. Um, so that's another pro tip for you. Uh, and so I thought, okay, you know, I should really be copying off the Nintendo more as I design this thing. So, you know, these little Goombas on here, uh, those are capacitors, and I started using those in my design too, which may have helped, uh, may just be superstitious. But there is a problem with this. Um, so I know EE geniuses that haven't already unsubscribed from my channel for from seeing the misinformation uh, before this in, the, in this video, or at least me being dumb. Uh, I'll give you a chance to redeem yourselves. So what is this component? And you already know it's a trick, of course, because why would I be asking? Of course it looks like a resistor. It's exactly a resistor. It's got, uh, it's got these lines on it to tell you the resistance and so on. But in fact, it is a capacitor. Uh, it turns out in the 1970s uh, in Japan, it was pretty common to use capacitor to use resistor packages for other components like capacitors because they had machines that could place these resistor-like packages on circuit boards automatically so so you got to be careful when you're copying um and no you know no one no one documents this stuff you just gotta <laughs> you just gotta uh stumble your way through it so i quite creatively went online and found an 8-bit lsttl compatible bus transceiver which is that thing in the middle of that big way too big circuit board um, in the center that's the one that i tried to insert into my nintendo breaking it uh, that thing at the top is a voltage divider, 8-bit voltage divider that I made out of resistors. That's actually a pretty reasonable way to do it. Um, sorry, that what that's doing is it's converting from the 5-volt output, that is the addresses, that the Nintendo is supplying uh, to th about 3 volts uh, for input to the Raspberry Pi. The reason I switched away from that approach is that uh, it seems to use a lot of power. Basically, building this voltage divider, you're just connecting um, the thing to ground and then finding a point in the middle of two resistors where the voltage is lower. And I was having problems with current draw. I'll talk a bit about that in a bit. Um, and so I wanted something a bit lower power and something that was a little bit more correct because I also have a lot of noise in my, in my system. So I ended up switching to a component that's like a bus transceiver um, on that side. It's just called a hex buffer. 
And in fact, each one of those chips is like cheaper than the 12 resistors that it replaces. Uh, and it fits much more neatly on a circuit board. So that's good. And with that, I was able to succeed in doing things like this. Um, I saw fit to record this one in slow motion. You can see that sometimes the zeros at the top change into W's and other letters, so awesome. And as I mentioned earlier, I started using ice hockey. It's a simpler game, uh, and here's what it looks like if you completely remove its own graphics. Um, you can still actually kind of see what's going on. Of course, the game plays, and then the sprites are just represented by these blocks. I'm still only controlling half the bits here, but I'm gonna start using that to actually try to time my graphics with the screen redraw so that I can get this, for example, checkerboard pattern, which is like also jumping out of my seat with joy. And then I moved on to some slightly more interesting phenomena. This is supposed to be a, like a bouncing ball. Uh, you can see a lot of noise and the balls kind of like spread out throughout the screen. Uh, I did a lot of work and made it a bit better. That's pretty reliable, still only half the bits. So here I'm rendering in pixel space rather than in tile space, so the circles are rather smooth. And I'm also using uh, two bits of color so that when they overlap, it's a different color. The main issue I was grappling with at this point was that the addresses that I was reading from the Nintendo were very noisy, and so I would return the wrong data. Uh, and the main way that I fixed that was voting. So basically I read the address pin several times um, during the read cycle, it's sort of spaced out, and then I take the majority, so if two out of three voted one, then it's one. Uh, if two or three out of three voted zero, then it's a zero. And that actually made a huge difference in uh, the quality of this. So after inserting my own graphics in there, I, I felt like I had enough confidence to just go all the way and do all eight bits. So I basically disabled ice hockey and switched to eight bits and I was able to get a full screen effect. Um, here are some test graphics. And then I was able to even remove the ice hockey program that's this chip on the left here. So since the PPU is basically not connected, uh, and I removed the CPU ROM, and I'm going to replace it with my own, uh, basically the only thing that's on this that's left is the copyright chip. And this is going to allow me to sort of make the transition from um, overriding an existing game to a wholly new game. This is a pretty terrifying prospect, though. The program that I used to replace the ROM with is simple enough, but unlike the graphics, if this doesn't work exactly, the CPU will go off wild and it'll just crash. So although I'm able to uh, emulate this ROM to test it out, I really can't test my hardware. And this is bad because I'm bad at hardware. So I bought this very reasonably priced EEPROM programmer, uh, which allows you to basically program a ROM, a certain kind of ROM, um, through a slow process. And uh, I also bought some EEPROMs to program. Um, there weren't that many that were suitable for me because I, I really wanted it to be through hole. I didn't want to do surface mount. I needed to be big enough um, and fast enough for the Nintendo's uh, specifications. So there's basically one. Unfortunately, although this programmer supports thousands upon thousands of models of EEPROMs, it does not support the one that I actually bought. Um, and it's not like I bought a weird one. I just bought it on Mauser. It was like the first result. Uh, so that stinks. I happened to find that their data sheet uh, for this chip was very similar to a data sheet uh, from another chip for another chip from another manufacturer from SST Micro. And I, I think it might be the same part or like one company bought the other or they're, it's, a, it's like a clone or something. So that one happens to be available. So I selected that in here. So, okay, hopefully this will work. Um, you got to turn off check ID. And, and I'm going to show you what it looks like to actually burn this thing because it's worse even than that. Um, open a ROM. Uh, load that up. And now let's try programming. Um, this thing has some great broken English in it, like this location in Skocket. So, okay, so I press program and a software data protection disable. Okay. This is actually seemingly working fine. Um, verifying. And then it just kind of hangs there. This might imagine this is my first time. Okay. Read error code 31. Okay, just waiting. Read error code 31. And in fact, it'll just keep doing that. So I need to kill the process. And basically that's it. I just got to cross my fingers and hope that works in addition to all the electrical characteristics. So I was basically like, if this doesn't work, I'm going to give up on this project. Because it's not like it was working um, great ahead of that time. But lucky me, it worked. Uh, this is exactly what it was supposed to show, more or less. Um, not that exciting. And also it could have been frozen, but at least I know it read my program at all. 
So next round is to make it animated. Here I'm just changing the palette. Um, I also have hooked back in all my PPU side stuff onto this new board, and so that's what all that red electrical tape is. And by the way, soldering takes a really long time if you're being careful about it with 16 uh, address bits and eight data bits. So uh, this was a, it was a labor intensive problem. But now that everything's hooked up and I can control the palette, I'm actually able to produce pretty good graphics, aside from some remaining noise, which I still haven't solved. With all those changes, my Raspberry Pi was getting pretty ragged. So I wanted to do something a little bit more modular and use one of these 40 pin headers uh, on a new Raspberry Pi and uh, connect it via ribbon cable to the main board. That way I can swap it in and I can try a different board because I was thinking about using a faster one. Boy, did this cause problems. So the cable you see up there is actually an 80 pin ultra ATA cable, which superseded the IDE cable, the 40 pin thing. And I thought these were compatible, uh, but they're not really because internal to the cable, there's connections like between ground pins. So that shorted out my board. Once I realized that, I thought uh, I must have like an old 40 pin cable somewhere. And despite having this huge box of wires, multiple boxes, um, it seems that at some point in the past, I decided, well, I'll keep my ultra ATA cables, but I'll throw away these old um, cables that have been superseded, because why would I ever need the old version of a thing? So shout out to my uh, neighbor and friend, William, who has a um, data center <laughs> of classic computers. And I uh, texted him and he was like, yeah, I definitely would have one of those come on over and harvest it. Um, so I switched to that, which was really good. And I could switch to the faster Raspberry Pi, which was nice. Um, and then I ordered some replacements off the internet. And so I could give this back to William. Uh, and those, when I installed those, it was a disaster. Uh, everything was failing in really weird ways. And I'll just jump to the chase. It was because I wasn't delivering enough power to the Raspberry Pi. And so I learned an important lesson that at some level I already knew, which is basically Ohm's law. Uh, I, I normally think of a power cable, a, a big beefy piece of copper as being important when I'm delivering a lot of power, that is watts. Uh, but it turns out actually, even at five volts, at, at, at 0.1 volts, um, it's the amperage that matters. And so because the Raspberry Pi was drawing upwards of two amps, um, over these small connectors inside the 40 pin ribbon, ribbon cable, there was enough of a voltage drop to cause the Raspberry Pi to fail. And in fact, the difference between William's uh, slightly beefier 40 pin cable and these slightly more anemic ones I got off the internet was enough to make that um, the difference between working and not working. So that was interesting, uh, making vigorously sarcastic air quotes as I say that. So while I was doing this, I was already in my second round of uh, ordering circuit boards from China. That's take like a week to get here, which is amazing. And they're not expensive. Um, the first ones had some problems. I mean, if you look at this rat's nest, the first problem is the rat's nest. You got to get you got to get this tidied up. And if you want to fit it into a cartridge, it's got to um, be something made by machines. And I'd never done this before. I'll just show you a second of what that looks like. So I designed the circuit board with a piece of software called KiCAD, which I think I can recommend. It's basically a clone of a classic piece of software called Eagle. And this is the schematic editor. This is where you design sort of the logical connections of your board. Um, each one of these things will become a wire, uh, but you don't have to worry too much about where the pieces are gonna go. It still helps you to think about that all throughout the process. And so here's the copyright chip. I can move that around and it's like a little bit smart about keeping my uh, wires connected. It's pretty tedious. This stuff is sort of um, arcane. Even this modern clone just has some funny old timey stuff in it. It has many components built in, but obviously something like the Nintendo's cart edge is not. Uh, and so I had to make this myself manually um, by measuring the Nintendo and I, I screwed this up. So this is gonna be one of the problems uh, with the first board. But if I had any other custom components on this, I would need to design uh, their sort of physical layout as well. And then there's the fun one. This is the PCB layout tool. So here's where I design the physical layout of the board uh, with the help of those two previous steps. So I know what things are supposed to connect to what, and it'll it'll make sure that I don't mess that up. Um, and I also know the physical layout of the components. But what I'm responsible for, you can kind of do this automatically, but it comes out better if you do it yourself. What I'm responsible for is actually designing how the wires go from one place to another. And this is a two layer board. So the red layer is on the front and the green layer is on the back. Um, some of the surface mount components, for example, only connect on the front but the through-hole ones, like this bus transceiver, those connect on the front and the back. 
And uh, it's a, like a fun puzzle to figure out how to do this um, so that you, you, know, you connect up all of the things without adding too much complexity. Now you can add uh, what are called vias. So here, a uh, trace enters a hole and then comes out the other side um, as a green line. And actually, you can have as many vias as you want. If you order this from a modern place, they don't really care. But it's sort of a badge of pride to lay out your board with as few vias as possible. They're considered sort of, it's like using uh, screws when you make wood uh, stuff or, or like tape in any project. It's like cheating. So this is my board. Um, and KiCad is a pretty good, it's a pretty good layout program. Like for example, I can, um, I like this feature. I can drag, and as I'm dragging, it'll like move all of the other wires. You see that? That's pretty cool. Um, sometimes you can get really bad results with that. And I don't want to mess up my precious board. It costs about 50 bucks to get uh, five of these from China, which is amazing. Uh, it takes a week, and unfortunately, my board contains several errors. So when I received the precious thing, uh, I try. You know, first thing I try to do is like compare it to a real cartridge to see if it's the right size, and it's not. What went wrong is a classic blunder that I'll try to help you avoid and help myself avoid uh, by talking about it. So on a circuit board, and all these circuit boards, um, it's standard to measure things in mils, which are hundredths of an inch. And if I look at all any of these components on there and I measure, it's going to come out to an even number of mils. So I measure these things, these are called gold fingers, the edge of the cart, and it comes out to 10 mils and so on the nose, and so I design my board around that dimension. Well, it turns out that 10 mils is 2.54 millimeters, so really close uh, to 2.5 millimeters, which is what these actually measure. So it turns out this part is the only component on the board that is measured in millimeters, thanks a lot. Uh, and here's my lesson for you. If you're going to measure something small like this that's in an array, measure the whole thing. Like measure 34 of these and then divide. That way your error uh, cancels out rather than compounding. I had to order new boards because there's no way I could fix that with like an X-Acto knife. And the new boards, they worked great. Well, they have other errors in there, but I could fix those in software. For example, I happened to get all of the bits backwards um, on the data bus so they were just in reverse. The board on its own does this. Uh, it plays that supremely annoying debugging noise and displays this animation that lets me know that it's working. Let's freeze this for a second so you can see that close up. Each tile here is actually sort of the same weird graphic and that's because I've completely removed all of the ROMs from this board, all the graphic side ROMs. And so due to the bus capacitance issue that I mentioned before, uh, each Tile's graphics read sort of as its own address, which is this 8-bit counter. Here it is assembled. Uh, those Goombas are capacitors, which are for power filtration. Basically, all they do, they're like little tiny batteries that stay near the power lines of each of those uh, chips. And if the power sags uh, because some other component is drawing too much current at that time, then they store a, a charge for a few microseconds that they can use to smooth that out. Here's the back, and speaking of power, I found it important to run a power wire specifically for the Raspberry Pi, which uses something like an amp of current. Um, the ground return is that big area that you can see, so that actually has low enough resistance, uh, but running a supplemental wire was pretty useful. The electrical tape that you can see is another error on the circuit board that I fixed with an X-Acto knife and a bit of solder. This one fits nicely within a cartridge by design. But I also switched and used a, a larger Raspberry Pi 3 in order to do multi-core stuff for the Super Nintendo demo. And this one does not quite fit in a cartridge. Um, I need to cut some holes so that it could go. I mean, it goes in the Nintendo, at least, so that part works. Those components aren't there because I need them or anything. They're just sticking out. Um, in fact, some of the components are in the way, and I had to in the, the 11th hour uh, desolder one USB header and dremel away half of another one which is terrifying. I could easily break the, the sensitive device. But it worked and now it fits. And I was able to leave the Nintendo completely unmodified. Uh, there is one thing I did to do, which was to replace the power supply. I didn't have an uh, original power supply anyway. 
I think the original one is about 1.2 amps, but I bought a five amp power, like laptop power supply, which I use for this, which is plenty of current. Um, I don't know, actually know whether this would work with the original power supply, but I feel like it's reasonably fair to, um, to upgrade that component and not touch the Nintendo itself. All right, well, this has taken a long time, so just a couple more topics here and then we'll be done. The slides for the talk portion or the video I made in Photoshop. Um, I mostly worked with the Nintendo palette, which you can see on the right hand side. Those are all the colors available. And uh, I drew them, you know, in the normal way. Then I would go through a process of exporting those um, through a pipeline that would convert them into graphics suitable for display on the Nintendo. And the main thing is, although I have those colors available, I can only show 13 of them uh, on the screen at one time. There's a background color. That background color is shared between four different palettes, and then the other three colors in each palette um, can be set to anything you want. And then recall the way that the PPU works. Every 8 by one strip, 8 pixels wide by 1 pixel high, has to consist of pixels only from one of those four palettes. So this is a bit of a constraint, both the selection of the colors and uh, the selection of which palette to use for each 8x1 strip. It's much better than the Nintendo, you know, sort of natively supports, uh, but it still re restrains or constrains my, um, what I can do with graphics. So here, this top portion, Nintendo Power, that's only using three colors. So that I'm going to be able to get exactly. But as I add more detail to the screen, either more total colors or more colors within a, re within a window, um, the, the process of conversion is going to need to be somewhat lossy. And here's the result of converting that drawing. Uh, if you look at the top, it's perfect. The question mark block has a, some loss of detail, and then those um, high color regions where I use a whole bunch of different colors, those didn't come out at all. At the bottom are the four palettes that are selected. Black is the background color. And the way I pick the palette overall is I look at every pixel in the image and I try to find its closest Nintendo color. And then I'm basically going to want to use the most popular overall colors uh, as part of my palette. But I actually do this in terms of colors that co-occur within the existing 8x1 windows. So I need red and I need yellow in there. I can tell that because there's a lot of that, and also green. But since the red is right next to the yellow a lot, they appear in the same 8x1 window, those need to be in the same palette. Uh, the green can be in a different palette. And so I basically take, I, can, I count these bigrams and I allocate them greedily, uh, but somewhat smartly into the palettes. And it's possible for the same color to appear in multiple palettes in order to satisfy those constraints. Once I've picked the palette, and that will be the same palette for the entire screen, uh, for each 8x1 strip, I compute the best palette to use to represent that strip. And I do that by basically computing for each of the palettes what would be my loss in sort of perceptual color space. And then, um, and then that becomes the palette for that one. And then I just need to encode each pix pixel to its closest color within that palette. And so that's a pretty straightforward uh, process. One other thing I can do, this is optional, is uh, run this procedure with different sort of offsets for those 8x1 strips. And that's because the Nintendo supports scrolling to arbitrary pixel offsets uh, along either axis. It's easy to do this along the x-axis in my setup. So if I scroll half a window, then uh, the constraints on one frame will be different offset by four pixels from the previous frame. And so this avoids some of the blocky uh, patterning that you see at sort of eight pixel boundaries. Um, on alternating frames. So let me show you how that looks in um, this short movie. I'll just flip back and forth between two adjacent frames uh, with different offsets so you can see how those affect the blockiness maybe. I think it looks really good at 60 hertz. Um, at 30 hertz, which is what this video is filmed in, it's, it's a little bit, I don't know, maybe it just kind of looks like flashing. This was actually the hardest part of getting the Super Nintendo to work, was preparing a Super Nintendo screen, which uses more colors than a Nintendo has available, uh, into the format that Nintendo can handle. And uh, I can't run this full procedure because it just takes too much time, especially the computation of color similarity using this Delta E uh, lab color space thing is very expensive. So I spent a lot of time optimizing this. And, and basically the trick is, um, other than writing good code, table lookups. So the Super Nintendo can nominally produce 16 uh, bits of color. That's 65,000 colors. So I can have a table for each one of those uh, what is its most similar NES color? And once I'm using a color table like that, um, doing things like counting the number of colors that appear on the screen the most often um, is simpler, faster thing. I don't need to do map lookups anymore. I can just look up in an array. Similarly, when I'm trying to pick the colors for each strip on the screen, 
I can compute the error using the similar table, which tells me for any pair of NES colors, uh, wh what is the sort of cost, the difference between them. So you lose a little bit of quality in doing this, but as, you know, in compensation, you get to run at 60 frames per second. And I'm doing that offsetting trick here um, in order to improve the sort of blockiness, the color resolution. Um, and I think you know the color is by far the, not the problem with this. It's the, all the noise and uh, the blinking, which I have some ideas what's causing that. But um, you know, eventually, you just got to call time on your projects. Uh, let's just talk about some future work, and then let's call it a day. Now, you'll notice that the uh, Mario demo didn't have any sound. There is no real limitation to doing sound, but it is complicated. The Super Nintendo has a pretty complex sound chip. And, uh, but I have a way of communicating back with the Nintendo CPU, which is what creates the sound. Of course, it would have to be sort of demade into uh, the Nintendo's sound hardware, which is just four 8-bit um, sound channels. Uh, but, you know, it, it might sound really amazing. I, I hoped that to have time to do that, but I didn't get to it. Um, one of the things you might want to be able to do, though, is you might want to be able to produce really high-resolution sound. This, the Nintendo can actually produce um, sort of pulse code modulated like waves, um, but this is very CPU and memory intensive. But there's a way you could maybe do this. And so what if we took the Nintendo, and I didn't do this, this is just speculation. Uh, what if we took the Nintendo CPU and reverse emulated it? So far, I've only been concentrating on reverse emulating the graphics subsystem, and I'm running a regular Nintendo program on a ROM uh, for the CPU. But if I replace that thing with some board, uh, well, normally what's happening is the ROM is, pr is feeding the CPU with instructions that it executes one at a time. Um, and I can't really get around that. The CPU, all it does is, is execute instructions. But normally there's a lot of overhead in the CPU of executing instructions um, because it has to do logic, it has to do branching, it has to read from a register, do something with that register, write it back to memory. So if I were to reverse emulate this thing and I could supply it any instruction at any time that I wanted, I would no longer need to do any of the logic on the CPU itself. And the CPU is fairly slow compared to my board. Instead, I could do all of the logic um, on, on the puppy side of this thing, and I could feed it instructions that only consisted of load this constant value into register and write it to this constant memory address, for example. So I would basically be able to replace the entire CPU's I.O. behavior with instructions that only did that thing. And you might be able to rather supercharge it. These are among the fastest instructions that exist, and you'd get rid of all of the logic overhead. So for example, streaming uh, samples off to the sound hardware, for example, you could take every Super Nintendo emulated sample, downsample it into something that's appropriate for the NES, and then stream it out. You could probably keep up and just be playing pretty high resolution audio through the Nintendo hardware proper without modifying it. Um, if you did this. There's some other things you might be able to do, like, although I said you can only modify the screen during V-blank, um, there is actually a very brief period of a few instructions uh, at the end of each scan line, the horizontal blank, which in which you can do something. And, and if you had a supercharged reverse emulated CPU like this, you might be able to write an entire palette um, during that, which would be pretty neat. Well, that's all the content I have for you this time. Uh, I almost got through everything. It's a, it's a kind of a long list, but no, I know no one really wants to watch. Uh, 40, 40 minute videos, except maybe you. Uh, anyway, it encourages me to make more if you comment or subscribe. Um, and I guess I'll see you next time.